I'm looking forward to what the Lord has for us tonight. Uh, you know, a while back, a while back, uh, the Lord just impressed upon my heart about the matter of praying for spiritual leaders. And uh, I said, you know, Lord, if you, uh, if you give me an opportunity, uh, I'll preach this if you direct me to do so at some places that, that you would open those doors. And uh, that's what I want to try to share with you tonight. And uh, this is probably a, a subject that a, a pastor would feel a little bit reluctant to, uh, to share uh, from the simple standpoint of uh, it may from a pastor sound self-serving, uh, although that would not be his intention. Sometimes it may sound that way. And uh, the pastor, I asked him, I said, you know, what's the direction of these meetings? What, what's your desire uh, in the meetings? And he said, you just preach what God lays upon your heart. And so that's what I want to try to do tonight with the help of the Lord. Just share with you what the Lord laid upon my heart in the matter of praying for spiritual leaders. Praying for spiritual leaders. And I want you to take your Bible tonight and turn with me to the book of Romans, the 15th chapter. Now your pastor told me y'all don't normally get out till about 9 o'clock. Is that right? Amen. No, I'm kidding. We'll try to be, we'll try to be brief, but we'll, we'll strive to be thorough as well. Romans chapter 15, I'll invite you to stand for the reading of God's Word together tonight. Romans chapter 15. And we're going to begin our reading in verse number 30. Romans chapter 15. And we'll begin reading in verse number 30. If you found your place, say amen. amen. The Bible says, Now I beseech you, brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake, and for the love of the Spirit, that ye strive together with me in your prayers to God for me, that I may be delivered from them that do not believe in Judea, and that my service which I have for Jerusalem may be accepted of the saints, that I may come unto you with joy by the will of God, and may with you be refreshed. Now the God of peace be with you all. Amen. Our Father, tonight we're so grateful for this opportunity that you've blessed us, Lord, to be here tonight. And God, we need your help. We need your touch. God, I realize tonight without you, I'm absolutely nothing. And God, if you don't help us, we, don't, we won't get any help. And so God, I'm asking you through the precious Holy Ghost, dear God, to help us here in this place tonight. I pray, God, that You would help this church. Lord, my desire, Lord, is to be a help to this body. And I pray, God, that You would enable me to be a help to them. And I pray that that which is preached tonight would fall upon good ground and that the Word of God would have free course in our midst. I pray, God, that You would have Your will and have Your way. And I pray that Christ would be magnified, the saints would be edified, and, uh, Lord, that You would help us to leave out of here tonight saying it's been good to be in the house of the Lord. Have your will and way in what you do. We'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. You can be seated this evening. Uh, you folks don't know me, but I, I just for a, for a moment of transparency, I, I want to tell you tonight that I feel that one of my greatest failures as a church member was in the matter of praying for my pastor. Now, it wasn't that I didn't pray for him, but I know I could have done a whole lot better job praying for him. And, and I believe every pastor would say this. I believe every pastor would say that he appreciates the prayers of God's people. I, I have no doubt tonight that there are people even now that are at our home church that are praying for me, uh, that know I'm preaching here tonight. Matter of fact, on the way in this evening, I got a text from one of the men in our church, and he said, Preacher, I forgot you were preaching out tonight. I want you to know that I'm praying for you. And what a blessing it is uh, to have folks that are in your corner and that are praying for you. Uh, you know, but I believe as a, as a general rule of thumb, the average Baptist church, and I'm sure this is not the case here, but the average Baptist church today is likely filled with more people that complain about their pastor than those that pray for their pastor. Uh, they complain about his preaching, but they do not pray for him. They complain about his decision making, but they do not 
pray for Him. And it's kind of like most people that complain about church spending. They do not tithe. And uh, you know, the people that pray for their pastor the least uh, are often the very ones that complain about Him the most. And I want to say to you tonight that there's a there's a great need to pray for your pastor. I, I have no idea why, but uh, this was on my heart to preach here tonight. And, and I thought about Paul's prayer request. Paul's prayer request. Did you realize tonight that they tell us that pastors are quitting by the droves? Uh, there are some that are, are, are saying that uh, many are quitting and uh, perhaps they're changing location, but they tell us that nine out of ten pastors will not make it in pastoral ministry to retirement age. Now, I don't know all the answers to that, but I do know this. The reality is that the pressures of ministry are demanding. And at times they are overwhelming. And somebody might say here, I, I mean, you know, uh, uh, well, let's all just have a pity party for pastors. I don't, I don't believe that's the desire uh, of pastors to have a pity party, uh, but they do want your prayers, amen. And they do want your support. And, and Paul mentions the pressures of ministry in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse number 28. Uh, he, he had just gone through a list uh, of all the difficulties and all, all the pressures that he had faced in the ministry. And he sent this in, in summation or at the a conclusion of what he was writing there. He said, beside those things uh, that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. Ministry can be overwhelming. And one of the things that will help every pastor across this great land is if they have people that will consistently uh, and will fervently uh, lift their name up uh, to the throne room of grace uh, and plea and ask God uh, to help to touch them uh, and to strengthen them for the journey of ministry and all of God's people said. Now what are some pressures that men of God face in the day and hour that we're living in? And then I want to share with you some thoughts about praying for spiritual leaders. I thought about this, there's, there's the pressure to produce. The pressures to produce. Did you realize that most pastors feel that the success or the failure of the church falls squarely upon their shoulders? If the church declines numerically, the pastor feels like it's his fault. It's funny, when things are going well, nobody gets the credit. But when there's a season of decline, the pastor gets the vast majority of the blame. And many pastors feel that pressure. They feel the pressure to produce. They feel the pressure to produce perhaps what the church across town is producing or what the people expect of them to produce. And though we aren't in competition with any church, it often feels that way because of the consumerist mentality that exists among many professing Christians. And what the church can do for me seems to be the prevailing mindset of the day and hour that we're living in. But I want to remind you tonight that it's not about what the church can do for me, it's about what I can do for the church. Amen. And so when we think about this pressure to produce, uh, I hear people often say things like, well, boy, they're sure getting the job done over at that church. And, and there's this pressure that comes upon a pastor to produce the same results. Not only that, but I believe there's the pressure in the day and hour that we're living in. There's the pressure to be popular. You know, most pastors don't wake up in the morning and think, well, you know, I wonder how I can possibly get more people to dislike me today. I, I don't believe that's the heart of any pastor. Uh, but you know, there's a pressure that's uh, uh, within, a pressure to be popular. Uh, and you know, a, a pastor cannot allow the ministry to become about what makes him popular or about what makes his church popular or about who may accept him or, or who may reject him. Yet there's this pre pressure that every pastor faces to tone down and, and to just be sort of a, a Sunday school teacher kind of preacher and, and not to be direct in his preaching and, and just to soften up a little here and, and soften up a little there. And there's this pressure to be popular in the day we're living in. Are you still with me tonight? I thought about this. There's the pressure to perform. 
the pressure to perform in this internet age and, and cosmopolitan preacher age. Pastors are facing the pressure to perform. They may not be quite as good uh, or quite as popular as the favorite TV preacher or the favorite YouTube preacher of the day that we're living in. And it almost feels like if they don't hit a home run at every at bat, all of a sudden somebody might want to trade them to another team. May I remind you tonight, that it is the Holy Ghost who sets the pastor in the place that he desires for him to be. The Bible reveals that to you and I. And yet there's this pressure to perform in the pastor's heart. What about the pressure to prepare? You know, every pastor faces the reality that the next service is coming. It's a never-ending preparation. And you know, these folks that think, well, you know, the pastor only works two or three hours a week. He's got it made. Uh, you know, they've never, they've never even taught a, su a Sunday school class of toddlers. They may have I'm telling you tonight, we're living in a time where some folks just reckon that uh, sermons fall from the heavens every Sunday morning. But no, there's preparation. There's preparation. And every time, I believe your pastor desires to give you something fresh from the Word of God. And oh, how it'd be different if the, if the people of God would pray for Him. Did you realize tonight that most pastors spend around 10 hours per week in sermon preparation? And by the way, these are stats from guys that don't even have Sunday night services. They don't they have they have small groups on Wednesday night. And so really they're only preparing one sermon per week. I, I saw guy I say that guys that are preaching three times per week are probably preparing somewhere more between the hours of 20 and 25 hours each week alone in the study. And, and you know, I try to often have uh, somebody preach for me if I'm returning from vacation. You know why that is? Because if not, that pastor will spend time on vacation vacation when he's supposed to be disconnected, spending time with his family, spending time with his wife, spending time with his children and that sort of thing. And instead of doing those things, he's thinking in his mind, Sunday's coming, Sunday's coming, Sunday's coming. And so he has to steal away and, and pray up and be ready when the time comes. And I want to tell you tonight that sometimes, uh, though we understand that study is a, a blessing and study, it certainly brings with it great benefits. We also understand what Solomon said in Ecclesiastes 12, 12, where he said that much study is a weariness of the flesh. And sometimes the pastor's best efforts are met with resistance and challenges and difficulties that I want to say tonight, and I hope you understand my heart, I want to be a help to this church. I hope you understand what I'm saying, that the average church member knows nothing about the pressure to prepare Week after week after week after week. Then there's the pressure to please. Are y'all still with me tonight? I, I mean, there's the pressure to please. I mean, tonight, uh, really, there's only one, uh, there really should only be one pressure with which we have to please. And that's the pressure to please God. Amen. I, I mean, I want to please God. Amen. I, and you know, uh, when we think about the pressure to please, uh, 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 the pastor desires to please God. Uh, he desires to please his own family uh, while not neglecting them. And then there are some folks uh, that he knows if he doesn't just do everything quite to their liking, uh, that they are gone or they will quit supporting him. Just one little slip or, or one little miss or, or he just wasn't there for them. That one time they stumped their toe uh, and they're done. Are you listening to me tonight? I mean, there's the pressure to please, please people and be a bit more passive towards sin and, and, and a lot less aggressive on separation. And, and when we think about the scriptural responsibility of the pastor, a, a man cannot give in to the desire or the pressure to please people uh, because the most important one that he is to please is the Lord Jesus Christ. And if a man of God pleases the Lord Jesus Christ, it does not matter who he displeases and if he displeases the Lord Jesus Christ uh, it does not matter who he pleases amen and so there's the pressure to please there's the pressure of the position the pastor's a leader they're to know the way go the way and show the way I, and many today want someone to marry them someone to bury them someone to visit them someone to preach to them but they don't want an overseer 
Uh, but you know, the word overseer, the term bishop, it, it's a supervisory role. And for a lot of folks, it's all good until the pastor has to be a supervisor and say, okay, we're not going to be able to do that. And, and so there's the pressure of the position, the position that he is in, that God has placed him in. And I realize tonight, uh, listen, that it's not the people that are going to give an account to God for the way the church operates. It's the pastor that's going to give an account to God. Uh, and listen, tonight the Bible still says in Hebrews 13, 17, Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, uh, for they watch for your souls as they must give an account that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. Amen. The pressure of the position. The pressure of peers. I mean, there's, there's peers that have gone a different direction. Pastor, how long have you been at this church? Ten years. Imagine in the ten years that you've been here, you've seen some of your peers that have gone a different direction. They, they've swapped their direction in ministry. They've swapped their ministry philosophy. They've swapped brides. They've swapped their Bibles. They've swapped their beliefs. And they don't preach what they used to preach. They don't stand where they used to stand. And, and when it's one of our friends, we have to make that decision. Are we going to make an exception or are we going to stick with the Word of God? And so there's this pressure uh, that pastors face with their peers. Then there's the pressure of their pocketbook. Is everybody still with me tonight? I mean, there's the pressure of their pocketbook. Uh, you know, the attitude of some folks is, uh, you know, Lord, you keep him humble and we'll keep him poor. Amen. And, and you know, some churches are, are paying their pastor like they live in the 90s. I mean, inflation is 15%. <laughs> I mean, inflation is 15%. That means everything is 15% higher than it was last year. In reality, that number is likely a bit skewed and hard to really pinpoint because there are some things uh, that are 100% higher than they were two or three years ago. Are you with me tonight? Uh, but the Bible says in 1 Timothy 5.18, For the Scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. I'll never forget years ago we had a man that got mad because the pastor, uh, the, the church bought the pastor a truck. And, and you know that man, I guarantee you he didn't tithe, he didn't give a dime. Uh, but you know, uh, there's the pressure of the pocketbook that pastors face. Then some are facing the pressure of physical decline and, and the pressure of people and so many other things that we could spend much time on tonight. There's the pressure of a psychological battle. Did you realize tonight the mind is the devil's battlefield. The bullets are flying in the mind of most pastors. Uh, many times they're wondering, I wonder if that family still supports me. I wonder if that individual still supports me. I, I, they're not been acting quite right toward me. Are they on the way out? They've started missing more services than they used to miss. And they're not here on Sunday night when they used to be here on Sunday night. And they're not here on Wednesday night when they used to be here on Wednesday night. And there's a psychological, a, a mental warfare that every pastor faces. And honestly, I think it's why many older pastors are not really close to any people and they have sort of a wall up because they have been betrayed so many times that they simply do not know who they can trust and so they, they just kind of keep their distance from folks. And I've said a hundred times that I don't believe in blind loyalty but the average church today has so much disloyalty that blind loyalty is hardly a problem. Amen. I'm trying to bear the heart of a pastor tonight and help you understand as much as possible without being in the position, the pressures. And by the way, let me just say this. It's a blessing to serve the Lord. I don't want anybody to walk out tonight and get the idea uh, that boy, that was just, that was just pitiful. I mean, how, how terrible it meant. No, no. It's a blessing to serve the Lord. Amen. I'm glad I'm in the army of the Lord tonight. I'm, I'm a happy, I'm a happy customer of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, and I'm glad to be in the service of the King. Amen. I don't know of any life I'd rather live than to live for the Lord Jesus Christ and to serve Him and to serve His people. And it is a blessing to serve the Lord and all God's people said. 
But people need to understand that pastors have fears. Pastors have feelings. Pastors have frustrations. Pastors have family. Pastors have flaws. Pastors have faults. I want to say to you tonight, we are but frail men at best. Amen? Now in Romans chapter 15, for those of you that are still with us, in Romans chapter 15, Paul is requesting prayer on his behalf. I want you to notice this very quickly tonight. I want you to notice first of all, the plea for their prayer. In verse number 30, in the first part of the verse, the Apostle Paul says, Now I, what? Beseech you. The word beseech means to to call to one side. He's often used this term. It means to beg. I think about in chapter 12, he said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Paul is beseeching them. It's an earnest appeal. It's a sincere appeal. And he's saying, I want you to come alongside me in prayer. I am pleading with you to come alongside me in prayer. The word is also used pertaining to the Holy Spirit. He's the comforter, amen. He's the one who comes alongside to aid the believer, amen. I'm glad tonight for the precious presence of the Holy Ghost inside of God's children. And we see this word here that that God is using through the penman Paul. He says, I beseech you, brethren, God's people, amen. That ought to be the praying people, amen. God's people ought to be praying people. And He is pleading with God's people to strive together. The word word strive gives us our English word agonize. It's a word that is used to describe the rest in the Greek games. It's it's an intense effort that is involved. And so I believe that Paul is saying here, he says, I want you to come alongside me and I want you to fervently pray on my behalf. I want to say thank God for the saints of God that are faithful to pray for the man of God and to lift his name up uh, to the throne room of grace uh, that God would come alongside and aid him uh, and strengthen him uh, and guide him and direct him. Uh, Thank God for those types of people. Amen. And so Paul's plea is that they would agonize for him in prayer. He pleads with the saints at Rome uh, that they agonize in prayer for him. I wonder how many Baptists are agonizing in prayer for their spiritual leaders. Hmm. In 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 25, he said to the church at Thessalonica, he said, brethren, pray for us. In 2 Thessalonians 3, 1, he said, Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified even as it is with you. I say to you tonight, I I realize that I could have come in and preached something we all could be swinging from the chandeliers, but we need that reminder tonight that God desires and, and the man of God desires for those that will come alongside and agonize with Him and pray on His behalf. And Paul knew that prayer was essential for ministry success. And so he pleads with God's people to come alongside and to agonize in prayer on his behalf. I wonder tonight if the average church member would take their pastor's name to the throne as much as they take it to the phone. I believe we might just have revival. Amen. I mean, if they pray for their pastor like they talk about him at the restaurant or in the nursery or in some other place. I believe tonight we might just have revival. I'm saying to you, Paul is pleading for those Roman Christians to agonize in prayer with Him. I read about in one region of Africa, the first converts to Christianity, uh, they, were, they were very diligent about praying. In fact, they are, they are said to have had their own special place outside of the village where they would go and where they would pray in solitude. And those villagers would reach those prayer rooms by using their own private footpath through the brush there. 
And when the grass began to grow over one of those trails, it was evident that the person to whom it belonged was not praying very much anymore. And because these new Christians were concerned for one another's welfare spiritually, there was a custom that became practiced in those days. And and when someone would notice that someone's prayer path was overgrown, he or she would go to that person and lovingly warn and say, Friend, there's grass on your path. I wonder tonight if there's any grass on your path. The path to prayer. Wilbur Chapman often told of his experience when as a young man, he went to become a pastor of a, of a church in Philadelphia. And after his first sermon, there was an older gentleman that said to him, you're pretty young to be the, the pastor of this church, but you preach the gospel and I'm going to help you all I can. And Dr. Chapman, he thought in his mind, he said, well, here's a crank, you know. Uh, But the man continued, he said, I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray that you may have the Holy Spirit's power upon you. And two others have covenanted to, to, to join with me in prayer for you. And Dr. Chapman said, he said, I didn't feel so bad when I learned he was going to pray for me. The three became ten. The ten became twenty. The twenty became fifty. And the fifty became two hundred who met before every service to pray that the Holy Spirit might come upon me. He said, I always went into my pulpit feeling that I would have the anointing in answer to the prayers of those who had faithfully prayed for me. It was a joy to preach and they said that the result was that we received 1,100 into our church by conversion in the th- in three years, 600 of whom were men. It was the fruit of the Holy Ghost in answer to prayer. And I say to you tonight that God's people again, once again, need to covenant together to pray for their pastor. You look every every preacher that that made a mark historically in this country and in, and in Britain and in other countries. You look at every man of God that's made an impact, uh, and every one of them, I guarantee you, you would read of their history and you would find the same thing that there were those that band together in prayer. You can read about Spurgeon and read about those uh, who prayed under the pulpit. You can read about the history of revivals, and you can read about those who band together in prayer. But we are in a day where prayer has been substituted for everything else. Uh, And I want to tell you, uh, it's not just mechanics that we need, uh, and it's not just that we need men uh, that are able to perform uh, and in their charisma uh, bring forth people. I say to you tonight, there needs to be a a band uh, together of prayer warriors uh, for God's men. Amen. The plea for their prayer. Secondly, tonight I noticed the persuasion for their prayer. In verse number 30, he said, I beseech you, brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake. Paul's aim and ambition in life was that Christ be honored and glorified. His life would best honor the Lord if God's people would pray for Him. I'm reminded of him writing the church at Philippi in the first chapter, the 20th verse. He said, according to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. Paul's desire for them to pray on his behalf was so that the Lord Jesus Christ might be magnified. I can't explain all of that to you tonight, but here's what I know. I know that when God's people pray for God's man, then God shines through him in a greater capacity. You ought to pray that your pastor's ministry and preaching would glorify God and draw people closer to Christ. You ought to pray that His walk with God would be strong. You ought to pray that God would make His study easy. You ought to pray that His life would remain clean. How many many times do we hear about pastors falling? How many times do we hear about pastors falling into sin? And, And you know, it's easy to talk about the pastor who falls into sin but maybe we ought to ask, I wonder if his church was praying for him. Pray that his family would be defended from the attack of the devil. 
Pray that no Delilah would entice him. Pray that his marriage would be strong. Pray that his wife would be strengthened. Amen. Pray that he won't get discouraged. Pray that his ministry would be fruitful and that souls would be saved through the preaching of the Word of God. Pray that God would give him wisdom. Pray that the pressures of the ministry wouldn't bog him down. Amen. Pray that his preaching will be of help to you. Pray that he would learn from any mistakes that he makes and instead of talking about him to some somebody else, uh, take his name to God and ask God to guide him and to help him. And if he's old enough to be your son or old enough to be your grandson, you ought to treat him with the same patience you would want your son or grandson to be treated with. Amen? I'm telling you tonight, many churches want a new pastor, but they're unwilling to pray for the pastor they've got. You ought to pray for your spiritual leader for Jesus' sake. I want to say that it's God's way that you come alongside of Him in ministry so that God can do a Christ-honoring work through that pastor. Then He said, for the love of the Spirit. The Spirit of God produces love in your heart toward fellow believers and toward spiritual leaders. And Paul, he appeals to these believers to manifest that love by calling his name out in prayer. Uh, Listen, I tell you tonight, I believe that folks will love a spiritual leader more if they pray for Him. Amen. The persuasion for their prayer. The plea for their prayer. Thirdly, the purpose for their prayer. Look what He said in verse 31. He said that I may be delivered from them that do not believe in Judea. Why pray for Paul? Well, one, I see that he's got some opposition. He's got those that do not believe in Judea. He's referring to the dangers that he may face among his countrymen, the Jews. Did you realize tonight that every God-honoring preacher is going to face opposition? Amen? Sometimes that opposition comes from without the church. It may be through governments that are putting pressures on on pastors to do A, B, C, or D. It it could be that they're pressuring them to shut their churches down in light of a pandemic. And by the way, that's not going to be the last time the government tries to shut the church down. My friend, that was just a trial run. You just wait till they start saying y'all need to stay at home because of global warming. Amen? And sometimes there's opposition that comes from governments, it may be legislators that seek to oppose God's church. I had a preacher friend of mine just recently that emailed me uh, that, that, that the left, they are planting spies in churches to see if they are what they refer to as radical traditionalists. Now, what's a radical traditionalist? I'll tell you what it is. It's somebody who believes the Bible and believes all the Bible without apology. Amen. That's what a radical traditionalist is to these lawmakers. And sometimes there's opposition that comes from without from the unbelieving crowd. There's opposition that comes from without from the Word. Sometimes it'll be the devil stirring up a hornet's nest from within. He will get one little disgruntled Baptist to find another group of Baptists to sow discord among and seek to get them disgruntled too. And I'm simply saying to you tonight that Paul said, I need you to pray for me because I'm facing some opposition uh, uh, from those who are in Judea. Hey, and by the way, let me just say this. uh, uh, Within every congregation, there are tares among the wheat. Within every congregation, there are those who are at heart unbelievers. And oftentimes, uh, they will rise up in opposition against the man of God and try to turn the church over and trying to destroy that which God is trying to build. Amen? And so sometimes that opposition comes from within. A preacher I knew not too long ago had had a group that rose up against him and, and voted him out. I know of another pastor who was who was at a church in our area and in that church he didn't get voted out, but just a little group came and forced him out. Are you listening to me tonight? There's opposition. Opposition. 
Spiritual need, leaders need prayer because of wicked and ungodly men. In 2 Thessalonians 3, 2, Paul said it like this. He said, "...and that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for all men have not faith." If you think everybody sitting in the house of God is saved by the grace of God, then my friend, you've got your head in the sand. There's the purpose for their prayer. Pray for those that may oppose them. But then I see, pray for their acceptance. Notice what he says here in verse number 31. He said that I may be delivered from them that do not believe, and that my service which I have for Jerusalem, notice this, may be accepted of the saints. That my service might be accepted. Pray that these Jewish believers... Here's what I believe he was talking about. I believe he's asking that they pray uh, that those Jewish believers will receive the offering that he is taking to them. Most believe that they'd not be inclined to do so because it coming from Gentiles. And even isn't it, isn't it something tonight that even uh, man's good can be misunderstood? And Paul says, pray. Pray that they'll receive the gift of these Gentile believers. You know, sometimes a pastor needs to be prayed for that his ministry will be accepted. A preacher has to preach the whole counsel of God. And sometimes the whole counsel of God is not always accepted even by those who are saved by the grace of God. Are you listening to me? Opposition, acceptance. Then he says, pray for opportunity. He said, pray that I may come to you. <laughs> pray that I won't be hindered and that I'll be able to come to you with joy and, and we can be refreshed by the fellowship one of another by the will of God. Pray for unhindered fellowship and opportunity. May I say to you tonight that pastors still need folks uh, to come alongside and pray that same prayer today. What an opportunity that all of us have to pray for our pastor, that he may come to them and that they could have felt. What, what a wonderful joy. Isn't it such a joy when a husband and wife have good fellowship with one another? I, I mean, we just came back from this, from this marriage conference. Some of you were there. And, and you know, a lot of that was, was dealing with the fellowship that we have with our spouse. What a wonderful thing it is for a husband and wife to be in fellowship with one another. May I say to you tonight what a wonderful thing it is for a church and their spiritual leader to be in fellowship with one another. I mean, when, when it's, just, it's just going the right direction. When, when it just, uh, it's like a hand in a glove, it just, it just fits. What a blessing that is and what an opportunity it is tonight that you and I have that we can pray, but that you can also pray specifically for your pastor. Now this has been hard. I'll just be honest with you tonight. I'd rather, I'd rather preach something else. But I believe that it's needed. And I believe that it's necessary. I, I would say to you like this, Paul was an apostle. Not any of those today, but Paul was an apostle. He was one that was directly sent by the Lord Jesus Christ Himself. The resurrected Christ appeared to Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus. And when he did, he said, I've got, I've got a work for you to do, a specific work, an appointed work, and that in apostolic authority. He was an apostle, the Bible says, was born out of due time. Now here I said that to say this. If Paul, as an apostle of Jesus Christ, needed the prayers of God's people, then do you think that perhaps 2,000 years removed from the time of the apostles that God's men still need our prayers today? Absolutely. There was a congregation that was singing as a closing hymn. 
an old familiar song, For You I'm Praying. And the speaker turned to the man that was on the platform and and asked him quietly, he said, For whom are you praying? And the man was stunned. He said, Why, I, I guess I'm not praying for anybody. Why do you ask? He said, Well, I just heard you say, For you I'm praying. And I thought you meant it. And that preacher replied, Oh no, said the man. I'm just singing. We got a lot of pious talk, don't we? But we need more than pious talk. We need praying saints. I wonder tonight, I wonder tonight, if God were to flash our prayer life or our pastor up on the screen, I wonder if we'd be disappointed. Pray for your spiritual leader. God's men need your prayers. Let's bow tonight.